Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. I'm coming to you from the Hans Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we've held the last four bread symposiums. And as you can see, there's nobody here but me. And this is where we usually have it. The seats are all empty because this year, thanks to you, the symposium will be presented online virtually in our new presentation hall, which is where I will join you in just a minute. Thank you, and thanks for being part of our new virtual Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puranos. Welcome again. Throughout the entire symposium, I'll be thanking our generous sponsors over and over again, and ask that you do as well by visiting their booths and pavilions in the Exhibitor Hall. There you will see lots of bonus content and you can also make appointments to meet with the folks from these companies that serve our baking community so well. Our presenting sponsor is Puratos, who has partnered with us from the very beginning for all of our symposiums. And it is their support that helped us get this one of a kind gathering of thought leaders off the ground. Please also visit our fabulous flour and milling sponsors, Ardent Mills. Lindley Mills, and Central Milling. Thank you also to our equipment sponsors, the WP Bakery Group, an allied bakery and food service equipment. And thank you also to our specialty food product companies, ProBioTeam, Fire Within, Big Green Egg, and Mock Mill. Please check out all of their booths to learn about their wonderful and unique products. And also thanks to our media sponsors, Cook's Country, The Local Palette, The James Beard Foundation, and the Bread Bakers Guild of America. You'll be hearing more about all of them throughout the entire series of presentations. So again, thank you to all our sponsors. At the end of today's presentation, you will also see our credit scroll thanking all of the people behind the scenes who made this event possible, including our production and technical partner, Ganoid Communications, our creative team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University, our hosts for this, our fourth annual gathering. So stick around if you will. But now it's time to get things rolling with today's presentation. So let's go live and once again, Welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. And here we are, we're live. And uh, yeah, I'm in the same place, but for the first time I decided to get out. It's a hot day here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm out of my jacket, into my Johnson & Wales t-shirt, part of my uh, a huge collection of, of t-shirts with bread themes or pizza themes. Uh, but I'm here to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today, uh, Michael Gensley, who will join us in just a second. He's already here. But uh, before we do, a couple of announcements. First, thank you and welcome back, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I've been really looking forward to this presentation for a long time because uh, every week, the questions come up over and over again, issues about sourdough, uh, questions about sourdough. And we keep saying, wait until the 14th of June. Uh, Michael's going to be coming and he'll, he should be able to handle most of the questions you can throw his way. Uh, but before then, let me mention also that this Wednesday, come on back for our Wednesday Bake Like a Pro presentations. Wednesday is always demonstration day. And Avery uh, uh, Ruzica from Manresa Breads in California will be here. Uh, Avery is an award-winning baker, and she's going to be demonstrating how to convert white flour recipes into whole grain formulas. So uh, a lot of you have asked those kinds of questions, and here's an opportunity to see how Avery does it. Uh, also, next week, uh, next Monday, uh, we have Patricia Kennedy and Sebastian Vessels from uh, the WP Bakery Group. They're going to be talking about the future of baking technology. And of course, all of this is outlined on the homepage of the, of the website, along with uh, bios, uh, abstracts, everything. Just go there for more details. I'm just reminding you to keep coming back because we've got more to do. 
Uh, next Wednesday, a week from this Wednesday, uh, we will have Idan Leshnik of Bread's Bakery in New York City demonstrating his, uh, I will just say for now, famous because it is the most famous chocolate babka in New York. And as I always say, if it's the most popular babka in New York City, then it's probably the best one in the world. So we're going to learn how he makes it, uh, how they do the lamination and the interesting techniques for their famous chocolate babka. And of course, week after week after week, still more to come. So with all that said, one final announcement. Um, starting this week, be sure if you haven't already started visiting the sponsor booths, we've now uh, installed a guest book in every sponsor pavilion or booth. And if you would sign those books with the information, it's just basic information for uh, contacting back, but also it will make you eligible. If you, uh, if you visit at least three booths and sign the books in at least three books, uh, three booths, it will make you eligible for our first drawing, which will come in a couple of weeks. We're going to spin this wheel of fortune with everyone's name on it who visited a minimum of at least three booths. And this first prize will be this incredible bread knife from uh, from Hankel's Willing Hankel's. Uh, I love this knife. Uh, they were kind enough to donate a few for us to give as prizes. And I will be mailing this one to whoever gets drawn in that first drawing. So um, visit the booths, not just to be eligible, but also to see the videos and the, the handout materials at each of the booths. And we'll continue to uh, do some of these drawings throughout the symposium. And I think that is all the old business. So I wanna welcome uh, Michael to join us uh, as, uh, as again, if you've been reading the abstract, um, today's topic is how to recruit microbes for sourdough baking. So we want to find out what does that mean, recruiting the microbes. And I'm sure that's why you're here. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and mute my screen. I'm going to go silent. But if you have questions, use the Q&A uh, button. Uh, you can also chat on the side. I will be monitoring all of that. I will gather them. And at the end of his presentation, uh, Michael will, um, will take some of the questions that we have time for. OK, Michael, it's all yours. Take it away. Peter, thank you for the introduction, uh, and thanks for having me on your uh, symposium. Let me share my screen. Uh, so the presentation of the topic, or the title of the presentation, is How to Recruit Microbes for Sourdough Baking. Uh, the talk is split in two parts. Uh, the first is uh, which microbes are in which sourdough, and the second part is how, why are they there, and how do they get there. Before I start, I may have to give an overview on the history of sourdough use because sourdough can mean very different things depending on why it is fermented and how it is fermented. Uh, sourdough use goes back at least uh, 14,000 years. Uh, sourdough was used since the onset of aquaculture. Uh, the historians disagree whether fermentation comes first and, and aquaculture later or whether it was the other way around. Uh, but since humans started growing grains, uh, leavening was the main purpose of fermenting sourdough uh, because other leavening agents were not available. Sourdough remained used as the only leavening agent for bread or other leavened goods uh, for the better part of the history of humankind. Uh, this changed only in the 1920s to 1930s. Uh, in 1871, uh, the first baker's yeast company opened, uh, selling dedicated baker's yeast for use as a leavening agent. Uh, but until after the 1920s, uh, baker's yeast was cultivated on cereal substrates, and only after the First World War, uh, baker's yeast production shifted to molasses, uh, which means only since the 1920s, 1930s, uh, yeast was grown without molasses, uh, or on molasses, which means you could buy pretty much pure biomass of Saccharomyces cerevisiae without any lactic acid bacteria. Uh, the third shift started probably 10 to 20 years ago. Uh, to put a date uh, for the shift in North America, I would use 2006, uh, when the first companies started to produce sourdough as a baking improver in North America. The company is one of the sponsors uh, of this symposium. Uh, so currently, the main use of sourdough is not for leavening or for acid, acidification, uh, but to improve 
spread quality and to obtain clean label products. Oh, uh, I think I, I skipped one thing. After baker's yeast was introduced and until sourdough became used mainly for improved bread quality, uh, sourdough maintained use mainly in Central, Eastern and Northern Europe uh, as a means to acidify dough because rye bread or rye doughs need to be acidified uh, to obtain optimal baking quality of rye breads. Uh, to give an image of this representation to the left side here, you see uh, the picture of a bread that I took in Pompeii in Italy, which was buried in the volcano ashes in 79. Uh, the shape is still perfectly preserved. So this was a nicely leavened bread, uh, which certainly was leavened with uh, sourdough. Uh, you may be less familiar with the large-scale automated uh, sourdough production that started in Europe uh, in the 1920s. Uh, the first large installation were in the former Soviet Union, where the forced industrialization of agriculture also meant forced industrialization of bread production and, because much of the bread was rye bread, uh, construction of large-scale automated um, sourdough fermenters. Uh, since approximately 50 to 60 years, you also have these instruments being common mainly in Europe. Uh, and currently, if you ask the baking, the supplier of baking equipment of your choice, uh, likelihood is that if they're able to sell you a fully automated high throughput bread making line, uh, they will include the option of adding a sourdough fermenter with this line. And then, of course, there are the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. Uh, what you see here in this slide is the frequency of the worldwide use of the term sourdough on Google. Uh, there is a conspicuous spike uh, which starts after March 2020, uh, which means after the lockdown started in spring last year, people uh, were at home baking sourdough bread. Uh, I think between March and June 2020, I received more requests for media interviews and from private persons uh, relating to sourdough than I have in the uh, 10 years uh, before March 2020. Why you use sourdough also determines how you ferment the sourdough, which then determines which organisms you have. Uh, let's start with what we call uh, type 1 sourdoughs, which are sourdoughs that are used for leavening of bread. If you do that in a bakery which sells bread uh, six days a week, uh, you can call this a never-ending ultramarathon. Uh, the sourdough just microbes just keep growing and growing and growing at all times. The feeding schemes are set up in a way that the organisms are always metabolically active, always metabolically active, never resting, never put into storage. Uh, one typical feeding scheme is shown here. Uh, you can ferment 10% of the flour overnight, 30% uh, of the flour for a short time before you start mixing up your uh, bread dough. Uh, but you have as many different feeding schemes uh, as you have bakers using sourdough as the sole leavening agent. What is common to all of these feeding schemes, they always keep the sourdough make microbes active and growing at all times. Uh, if you ask a baker, uh, they will tell you that Mondays are the most difficult days of the week since even the short rest uh, on Sunday uh, where the bakers may cut one feeding cycle uh, to have a little bit of rest already impacts the leavening capacity of the sourdough. That means two refreshments a day, 15 refreshments a week, more than 750 a year, uh, and most sourdoughs are older than the bakers that maintain them. Which organisms do you find in these sourdoughs? In almost all cases, you find a combination of Fructi lactobacillus sambatoscensis and Kazakhstania humilis. Uh, in a small proportion of the sourdoughs, there is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, there are a couple of other organisms which are either associated with Fructi lactobacillus sambatoscensis. Uh, this includes here Brevis ficari and Hamesii, Levi lactobacilli, 
but also company lactobacillus alimentarius mendensis and ancanthus are often associated with fructi lactobacillus and what is cancer. Uh, but this is the organism which you almost always find in type, sour, type 1 sourdough, uh, which is fermented in bakeries. What happens if you do the baking at home? Uh, the one difference is that baking at home means you start storing your sourdough. Uh, this is taken from a paper uh, that analyzed more than 500 sourdoughs and also more ex almost exclusively from home bakers and also asked questions about how the sourdough was maintained. Uh, very different from bakery sourdoughs, amateurs start store their uh, sourdough, uh, usually in the fridge. Uh, the number of feedings is much lower. Uh, the peaks here are five and have a little bit over more than 10 feedings per month, uh, which roughly corresponds to one to two baking days per month. Uh, this is 10 to 20 times less than the more than 100 feedings that a sourdough will receive in a bakery. Uh, the starter age for the most part is less than five years, uh, which compares to more than 50 or up to 170 years um, for bakeries that are maintained in sourdough. Uh, the 170 years relates to the quite credible documentation that some of the sourdoughs uh, in San Francisco have been maintained since the 1849 uh, gold rush, but that's not unique. Uh, we have documented evidence for German and other sourdoughs which are more than 100 years old. What changes in these Amateur sourdoughs or in spontaneous sourdoughs and in sponge doughs, uh, your number of organisms changes fundamentally. Uh, all of a sudden, Plantarum brevis fermentum start to be much more dominant than, than Fructi lactobacillus and Vatiscensis. Uh, in many sourdoughs, you have Vicella species, uh, some lactobacillus species, and company lactobacillus species, so interrupting the never-ending ultramarathon by a couple of weeks of refrigerated storage seems to fundamentally change how organisms, which organisms dominate in the sourdoughs. Uh, a recent publication uh, out of North Carolina gives some indication. Uh, so these are the main species in over 500 household sourdoughs. Uh, so the colors here are mainly blue, green, uh, Brevis plantarum being the most frequent ones, uh, and analyzing the data, if the sourdough was obtained from a bakery, it was much more likely to contain fructi lactobacillus and vatiscensis. If not, then it was much more likely to contain levi lactobacillus brevis. The young starters contained brevis and plantarum. The old starters were much more likely to contain Lady Lactobacillus and <clears throat> Even a less extensive interruption of the baker uh, of the of the feeding of the sourdough can change the microbiota. Uh, a publication by uh, Delphine Picard analyzed sourdoughs which are used by farmer bakers, which have two to three day baking days per week and some periods of cold storage, versus bakery sourdoughs, which have this 24 hour seven, six days a week, 300 days a year. Uh, and they found the shift in the yeast microbiota with Kazakhstania humilis being dominant only in the bakery sourdough uh, and different Kazakhstania species taking over in the uh, sourdoughs, which are used for extensive baking in farm by farmer bakers. Let's move to the industrial fermentations. Uh, and these are fermentations that uh, you may not be as familiar with uh, in North America, uh, but they have been used in Europe for more than 50 years. These fermentations mainly aim to achieve acidification of rye flour, uh, but also to support leavening and to improve uh, bread quality. Because the technological aim shifts, the fermentation condition shifts. If you ferment for high levels of acidity, uh, you ferment for a longer time and for a higher temperature uh, to achieve higher levels of acidity. Uh, most or all of these sourdoughs are still backslot uh, with documented age of up to 70 years. 
This has been used in the Soviet Union since the 1970s. In Central Europe, I'm aware of installations starting in the 1970s. Uh, in North America, these industrial installations of sourdough production are currently emerging in a, emerging in a very big way. Which organisms do you find in these sourdough? Uh, you still find convergence in the composition of sourdough microbiota, but in this case, the convergence is at the genus level and not at the species level. Uh, note that the N is much smaller because there is fewer literature data for large scale industrial operations than there is for uh, small bakeries. Uh, what you see is almost always an association of lactobacillus species and limosi lactobacillus species. Lactobacillus species, a frequent uh, example is Lactobacillus amylovorus. Uh, of the Limosi lactobacilli, we often find uh, Limosi lactobacillus pontus and ruteri, uh, but there are a couple of others. Uh, for the yeast population, the sourdough is Saccharomyces cerevisiae or none. Uh, if the fermentation is high at a high temperature and for a long time, uh, there are few, if any, yeast. That gets me to my first interim summary, point one. How we ferment the sourdough determines which organisms are there and how we ferment the sourdough is determined why we include sourdough in the, in the bread making. Uh, and the reasons for using sourdough can be very different uh, in different bakeries, industries, or at home. Type one sourdoughs that are used for leavening are orange, Type two sourdoughs, which are used for acidification, are red, uh, and spontaneous sourdoughs and amateur sourdoughs are colorful. In the second part of the presentation, uh, let us examine what these colors mean for the first place, uh, and second, how the difference come about. Uh, before I get there, I want to introduce you the four important concepts in community assembly, and that's communities of organisms very generally. Uh, it was published uh, by Valen, the professor from Sherbrooke uh, in Quebec, uh, and that was one of the most important publications I've read in the past couple of years because it provided me with the terminology to express something that I sort of knew but couldn't write properly because I was lacking the words. Uh, the how communities of organisms get together is explained by four basic concepts. First is diversification, uh, diversification, uh, diversification. Organisms adapt as a consequence uh, to a living in a new habitat. One example would be Darwin's finches, which evolved in the Galapagos Islands uh, of the South American coast. The second concept is drift, which relates to random events that lead to differences in dominant organisms. Uh, a prominent example is the meteor that hit Earth around 65 million years ago uh, and contributed to the extinction of all dinosaurs. The third piece is uh, selection which relates to fitness difference between strains or species, which means one organism outcompetes the other. Uh, the illustration here is the fishes and the biggest one wins because all the others are eaten. Uh, and the last concept is dispersal, which refers to movement of organisms from one ecosystem to another. You could also call it contamination. Uh, the example here is the koala bears, which survived in Australia for the simple reason because the placental mammals that are that outcompeted marsupials everywhere else in the world never made it to Australia because it's surrounded by large bodies of water. How do these concepts relate to sourdough? First question, is sourdough old enough to allow speciation? Have our sourdough organisms actually adapted to sourdough? For the bacteria, the answer is clearly now, uh, no. We by now have sufficient genome sequence data and sufficiently precisely calibrated molecular clocks of evolution 
uh, to date the age of a species. One example is shown here, uh, the Mosey lactobacillus ruteri, which occurs in type two sourdoughs. The last common ancestor of, of all strains in the species lived at least 50,000 or 50,000 years ago. Uh, you compare these evolutionary timelines um, to the time when humans started sourdough baking, which is no more than 12,000 uh, years BC. Uh, and we observe, we have obtained sourdough isolates from multiple strains of this lineage. So sourdough is not a lifestyle. The organisms in sourdough did not adapt the sourdough. They just happened to get there and be more successful than others. The story is different for yeast. Eukaryotic species, which have, can have multiple genomes and which rep, uh, reproduce by sexual replication, they evolve very different from bacteria. Uh, and uh, my colleague, uh, Delphine Sicar from Indra and France, she has recently demonstrated that some, but not all, sourdough yeast show signs of domestication, which means these yeasts have been sex locked in a sourdough long enough. Uh, to actually change their genetic makeup and their physiological properties. So that's true for yeast, not for bacteria. Let's go to dispersal imitation. Uh, dispersal, again, relates to our organisms to get to the ecosystem in the first place. Uh, let's start with the anecdotal evidence. Uh, one, uh, by now we have probably at least 50 publications that start aseptic sourdoughs in a laboratory uh, and maintain it by periodic backslopping under sterile conditions other than using non-sterile uh, cereal flowers. These aseptic laboratory fermentations have never been reported to contain fructilactobacillus ambatoscensis, the most typical organisms for sourdoughs that are used for leavening in bakeries. If you talk to bakers, uh, and my, my experience is mainly with Canadian and European bakers, uh, a few Chinese bakers are on the list, list as well. They if they start sourdough, they don't start the sourdough with flour and sterile water. Uh, on the first fermentation step, and only on the first, uh, many bakers use different plant materials that can be flowers, onion peels, mother or vinegar. Uh, in some cases, manure is deliberately added. Uh, I was witness between a debate of two Italian bakers. Uh, a debate was not whether or not to use manure. The debate was whether to use cow manure or horse manure. Last but not least, uh, we have recognized for a long time that the lactobacillus community in type two sourdoughs appears to be virtually identical to the species that you find in the pig industry. Can we probe that experimentally? Uh, one of the experiments which does that was made five years ago. Uh, in this case, sourdoughs were started in the laboratory with wheat and flour and sterile water, but with addition of different plant materials on the first fermentation step and only at the first fermentation step. Uh, we used apple flowers, mustard flowers. I forgot what the English name is for this plant. Um, berries, pomegranate, and mother of uh, natural vinegar. Uh, and depending on which plant material we use to start the sourdoughs, we got a very different composition of the bacterial communities after 10 refreshments. In this case, different from everything that was ever done with flour and water only. Uh, we had a couple of sourdoughs which included Fucti lactobacillus and Vodiscensis. Uh, in some cases, Lati lactobacillus graminis. Uh, in some cases, the typical Plantarum rossiae combination that you would often find also in the flour and water only sourdoughs. So, interim sourdough. If you start a new sourdough, the establishment of competitive strains in sourdough is limited by dispersal, which means how likely is a certain organism to contaminate your sourdough. Diversification, dispersal. Uh, the third concept is selection, uh, which means how can you quantify which of two organisms uh, is more competitive and will outgrow any other organisms. 
Uh, this can be done by starting sourdoughs with a defined inoculum of wild type strains of different lactobacillus species uh, or different strains of the same lactobacillus species or by using isogenic Newton strain. Uh, then you backslop the sourdough that was inoculated with these two strains for a certain amount of time. Usually 10 to 15 backsloppings uh, is, is sufficient. Uh, and then you need a method to differentiate the strains. Currently, strain-specific primers, which are based on the genome of the strains, is the uh, state-of-the-art method. This has been done a number of times uh, in the past decade. Uh, ground zero of using this, these competition experiments was in 2003, uh, when I lab in Hohenheim published an experiment which interrogated type 1, type 2 selection criteria uh, by adding the same mixture of, I think, five different starter cultures into the same batch. Uh, we were the first to publish in 2011 uh, the first competition experiments with isogenic mutants. To give you one example on how the results look like, uh, here we have wild type strains of Limose lactobacillus ruderi and two isogenic mutants. The first mutant has uh, the gene disrupted, which codes for glycerol dehydratase, uh, and disruption of this, of this gene reduces the growth rate uh, in sourdough by approximately 10%, which is, doesn't sound like a whole lot, uh, but it was fairly significant. Uh, the second mutant has uh, a disrupted glutamate decarboxylase gene, uh, and disrupting this gene will reduce the acid resistance. Uh, now you can backslop your sourdough under defined conditions. Uh, this is the result for the 12-hour backslopping, which is almost almost uh, matching uh, the type 1 sourdoughs uh, because the uh, organisms are growing and metabolic metabolically active almost all of the time. Uh, here we see that acid resistance has no impact on the competition. Uh, on the white bars, you see that the Block transformed ratio of mutant to wild type stays very close to one, uh, which means knocking out acid resistance does not impact the ecological fitness of the mutant. The story is very different. If you reduce the growth rate by 10%, you see that after eight backstoppings, the ratio of wild type to mutants has gone from roughly one to one to 100,000 to one, which means even a small difference in the growth rate will mean that the faster growing strain outcompetes the slower growing strain very quickly after only very few refreshments. The story is different if we go to a type 2 fermentation scheme. Uh, here the incubation time was 72 hours, which meant 8 hours of growth. Uh, followed by around about 64 hours of survival at acid conditions. Here, the growth rate was still very important, even more important than in the type 1 scheme. Uh, but in addition, we see uh, acid resistance being a second uh, selection criteria. Uh, you can also look at this game if you look at, at a spontaneous fermentation. Uh, if you make a spontaneous fermentation, which means you start your sourdough with wheat flour or rye flour and water, uh, you invariably have inoculate your dough with Enterobacteraceae, E, Enterococci, Leuconostoc and Vesella, and very few Lactobacilli. Why is that invariable? Uh, these organisms are associated with plant material. Some of them are endophytes, and the Enterobacteraceae E are, with a large margin, more abundant than any of the Lactobacilli uh, and Enterococcus and Leuconostoc are much more abundant uh, than the L. plantarum or L. brevis. What starts if you start to, if you, what happens if you start to ferment? Your Enterobacteraceae start to grow, but and the Enterococcus and Lactococcus start to grow. These two are more acid tolerant as the Enterobacteraceae. As soon as the pH is too low, these organisms drop out. So now you see dominance of Leuconostoc and Vesala, uh, but again, Lactobacilli are much more acid tolerant than Leuconostoc and Vesala. Uh, the cutoff point is roughly pH 4.5, which means after you reach 4.5, these organisms die. 
Plantarum and Brevis continue to grow, and uh, Lactiplantibacillus Plantarum and Levi Lactobacillus Brevis will dominate almost invariably the fermentation after a couple of years. Which means you stratify by abundance and acid resistance. The most abundant organisms are the first to dominate. The late, the, the most acid resistant organisms, which is always Brevis and uh, Lactiplantibacillus, uh, they will start to dominate after a couple of backstoppings or after a sufficient uh, fermentation. What do we select for? Uh, and I stopped the drift because if you look at one sourdough, it may have an impact. If you look at many different sourdoughs, it doesn't. Uh, in long-term backslop sourdoughs, most or all of the lactobacilli are host adapted. Uh, and this is where the color comes in. Fructilactobacillus ambodescendus and other fructilactobacillus species, they adapted as symbionts of insects. They have a very narrow ecological niche. Uh, Limose lactobacillus and lactobacillus species, they are adapted to the intestine of vertebrate animals, some humans, but also pigs, chicken, and rodents. In spontaneous and amateur sourdoughs, the lactobacilli are either nomadic or environmental. Why is that the case? Uh, we can identify selection and dispersal limitation as major forces driving the sourdough ecology. Long-term backstopping of sourdoughs is important because it eliminates dispersal limitation. Uh, Fructilactobacillus ampodescensis originates from an unknown insect. We don't quite know where, but even an unlikely contamination event from some obscure beetle or fly will happen eventually if you start backstopping your sourdough for months and years in your bakery. So the stability of long-term backslop sourdoughs is explained by elimination of dispersal limitation. And with that, I went a little bit over time. I will stop the presentation and uh, I hope we have sufficient time to answer questions from the audience. Great, and I, I'm going to unmute my phone, my uh, audio and my camera as well, so I can join you as the uh, the go-between for folks who may have questions. And, and folks, this is your chance to start writing your questions. Um, uh, we, there's one that came in, um, and it's funny because I was uh, paralleled one, a note that I made to myself also to ask you for clarification for those who are not familiar with the term backslopping. Is that the same as what we would call refreshing your starter, feeding it a new, uh, a new feeding? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry for not defining it. That would mean you take a small part of the previous batch of sourdough, and then you you inoculate the next batch. Yes. And again, in some in some bakeries, there is credible credible documentation that this process was uninterrupted for a period of much more than hundred years. So, if if I'm understanding um, the, the way you were describing it, that um, the, the, the period of time in between the intervals of backslopping or, or refreshing uh, definitely affects the, the development of particular species of, uh, or, or types of bacteria, is that correct? So like, like frequent feedings uh, encourage certain colonies and infrequent feedings encourage others? Is that a correct uh, assumption? That is correct. Uh, let me let me explain that a little bit more. Uh, if you leaven with sourdough, you leaven your 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 bread with less than five percent of the microbial biomass that you have in a baker's yeast produced bread. Which means your microbes need to be more than twenty times more active. Otherwise, you never get sufficient carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way to get there is feed your sourdough in a way that you maximize metabolic activity and carbon dioxide production. And you only the only way to achieve that is to never stop them from being from growing. This is the never-ending ultramarathon. If I say 100 years of sex stopping, this means 
the microbes have divided once every hour for more than 100 years. Uh, and this process puts very stringent selection on the fastest growing organisms. And the fastest, grow, or fastest growing organisms in wheat and rye flour is Fructilacta bacillus sambadiscensis and Kazakhstan yahumenis. And for me, the most astonishing piece is if you compare Chinese steamed bread, Italian panettone, Vespasian pumpernickel, and San Francisco sourdough bread, the products are completely different. But the selection criteria or, or the, the criteria that the bakers use to, to control the fermentation are ident identical because they all need to change their fermentation to maximize metabolic activity. And in all products, they run with some of the Kansas and Kazakhstan Yahoo So along that line, the question's coming in, uh, does the, does the um, hydration of the uh, Levan, the, is it, whether it's a liquid, uh, spongy, uh, st you know, uh, sourdough starter or a stiff, firm sourdough starter, does that affect the development uh, or the speed of development of these organisms? I would say yes, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, let's start with the no first. Uh, over, the, over the past couple of years, I probably had in-depth discussion with, with a dozen or so bakers. Uh, and in my experience, bakers do things very differently. One likes to ferment cold with stiff sourdoughs. The other one does it warmer with a little bit more liquid sourdough, but they have very different fermentation times. Uh, and nevertheless, if they leaven with sourdough, it's always the same combination of yeast and bacterial species. What you can influence, uh, you, can, you can influence in a type one sourdough, you can influence the ratio of yeast to lactobacillus. Uh, and some of the bakers I talked to in Edmonton, they insist that they don't want to have this strongly acidic flavor and taste uh, that is often associated with San Francisco sourdough bread. Uh, so they aim to propagate their sourdough uh, on the yeast side, uh, which means they go colder and with a lower hydration. Uh, the species are the same, uh, but the ratio of yeast and lactobacilli is different, which means your, your product is, is a little bit different. Uh, and, you know, if I teach this, I usually try to convince my students that sourdough bread can be sour, but it doesn't have to be sour. Uh, because if a baker knows what he or she is doing, they can ferment in a way that the acidification is not so prominent that it overwhelms all the other flavors and tastes that you get in your bread. Interesting. Um, so there's so, so many different factors that can affect the, the outcome. Uh, well, well, let me, before I uh, lose the thread of this one, it's come in a couple times, some questions. Can you go back and talk a little bit about this, this notion of using manure as a, uh, as part of the, the starting point of some of these starters and, and what, how does that work? Can you describe that a little bit more, uh, unpack that for us a little bit? Uh, that's, that's easily, that's easily described. Uh, you take a literal piece of shit and you put it into the first batch of your sourdough uh, and then you backslap often enough until you're comfortable eating it uh, and then you start baking. But, but and the, bakers, the two bakeries which claim that their sourdough has been started with manure, they started their sourdough more than 50 years ago. Right. It seems there is not a possibility that even a water molecule from the initial manure um, is left in the current sourdough. Uh, and one of the last things that we've done, we tried to use sourdough to hydrolyze fructans in bread. Uh, and the only place, and the only place where you find lactobacilli, which are capable of degrading extracellular fructans, is the pig gut. Don't ask me why, but lactobacilli and the pig gut, gut can do it. No other lactobacillus can do it. Uh, and the one bakery which tried to select for fructan degraded lactobacilli, they found fructan degrading lactobacillus uh, crispatus. I don't have the smoking gun, but if you ask me about my level of confidence that this strain originated from a pig intestine or from manure, my level of confidence is very high. Interesting. Well, if for, if for those of us who don't have a strong scientific background, uh, can you uh, uh, Go back to that term, the fructans. 
What is that? What is their functionality in all this? Fructans are polysaccharides composed of fructose. Uh, they have two functionalities in baking. Uh, in a wheat, in wheat you have approximately one to two percent of fructans. Uh, in rye, you have approximately two to five percent of fructans, mm. uh, and that means there are chains of four to ten fructose molecules which are bound together. In every sourdough, the yeast hydrolyzes a little bit of the fructans, and that gives fructi lactobacillus this candis fructose for production of acetic acid. So if you if you want to explain acetic acid levels in a wheat sourdough, you get back to the to the fructans. The second piece, if you look at the non-celiac wheat intolerance or irritable bowel syndrome, those 30% of customers in the United States that avoid anything which remotely includes wheat, uh, a very large proportion of the uh, consumers react to the fructose because some individuals can't digest fructose, which means it's rapidly fermented in their intestine, leads to too much gas production, diarrhea, bloating, all kinds of negative side effects. Uh, so some of our research in this lean was trying to degrade fructans to prevent that some individuals have adverse reactions to it. And so just going back one half step on that is, so what is it that causes the degrading of the fructans? It's an extracellular enzyme, uh, which you find in very few lactobacillus species. All of them come from the pit gut or sourdough, and those that come from sourdough likely originated from the pit gut. Uh, a group in Belgium has identified some yeasts that also have extracellular uh, fructan hydrolases, uh, but ye these yeasts are not common in sourdough, which means you need to put them back consistently to maintain uh, the yeast species and the enzyme activity. Interesting. Um... Let me you know, return to some of the questions that are coming in. Uh, one, some, one, one viewer wants to know, is it possible to determine the age, location, frequency of use, et cetera, of a sourdough by looking solely at the bacteria types that are found in it, in that starter? To some extent, to some extent, yes. Uh, first, location, location never matters never matters. And I, I emphasize uh, the Kazakhstania fructi lactobacillus combination. You find it in China, you find it in Iran, you find it in Arabia, you find it in Italy, you find it in Germany, in Sweden, in Canada, and in the US. Whenever somebody leavens, ferments for leavening, it's always the same, so location doesn't matter. Second point, you find this combination always uh, in meat and rice. You never find it in any other cereals for reasons which you can partially explain, uh, but not to the fullest extent. Uh, and so if you tell me that a sourdough contains fructi lactobacillus ambotiscensis and Kazakhstania uh, humilis, I would tell you this sourdough is used in a bakery, is used for as a sole leavening agent, and it has been used for probably at least a year. Uh, if you tell me a sourdough is populated by Levi lactobacillus brevis and uh, lactiplantibacillus plantarum, my assumption is the sourdough has been used very, has been started very recently, or refrigerated storage is a big part of how the, the sourdough is used. Uh, and I think that's about as far as the conclusions go. Uh, for the combination of the gut organisms, Limosi lactobacillus and lactobacillus species, uh, that is typical for anything which is fermented at a high temperature, so high levels of acidity, uh, but that's ab about as far as it goes. Uh, other than that, it's difficult to conclude. One point is, and particularly if you go to amateur bakers, you know, 100 bakers have 200 ways of propagating sourdoughs. Many of them, not all of them, keep it uninterrupted. Many of them, not all of them, use it as a sole leavening agent. You know, from my perspective as a home baker, I have no issues 
putting a little bit of baker's yeast in the final dough to, uh, to get the leavening power up. Uh, so different bakers use it for different purposes, they ferment different times, and that's why the overall diversity of species in, in all sourdoughs is very high. So if I'm hearing this correctly, then you, you can sort of determine how frequently a starter is refreshed or backslot, and, and, but you can't determine what city that's being made and the, 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 the types of bacteria that are in there are not going to uh, serve as kind of like the uh, terroir of that particular sourdough starter uh, based on location, but more through the uh, method that the baker is using for keeping it uh, viable and vibrant and potent? No, in my view, and that's not only based on the observation of sourdough microbiology, there is no terroir in the microorganisms in fermented foods. Right. If there is terroir, I know that pumpernickel tastes different from panettone and San Francisco sourdough bread. Uh, I've done the comparison side by side, and that's region, culture, heritage, but it relates to which cereal you use, how you build them, how your final bread recipe is composed. So the terroir is with the bakers, not with the microorganisms. Yeah, I get so it's more about, yeah, it's more about the method that's used as opposed to the location and the grains and the ing other ingredients affect the, the outcome as much as the, as the starter in terms of its, uh, you know, in terms of identifying where that bread was being made. You can make the same bread in different parts of the world. Um, let me see, quick more questions before we run out of time. Uh, what do you recommend to make the sourdough stable and consistently working? Are there guidelines for how to make it consistent and stable? Sourdoughs in this respect are like small children. Uh, they like it if you do the same thing at the same time every day. Uh, let's put it. Let's put it that way. Uh, if you have a consistent feeding scheme, if you have a consistent feeding scheme, uh, the sourdough will perform reasonably well. You know, in terms of how often you feed it and how much you feed it. If there is failure of a sourdough because it has been in the fridge for too long or, or something other happened that wiped out part of the microorganisms. Throwing dirt at the sourdough can help to get it back. Uh, because if you add plant material or if you so choose, uh, if you add manure, followed by a sufficient number of backslopping steps to eliminate the hygienic risks, uh, you will introduce new organisms that can take the place of the organisms that died. Uh, and last but not least, uh, and that goes to the uninterrupted um, ultramarathon. Uh, if you want to get a sourdough back into action, the one thing that usually helps is give it a sufficient number of refreshments or backsloppings before you start baking again. Uh, so sometimes my sourdough is out for two months instead of the usual three weeks. Uh, and then I do know that my five refreshments before baking are not going to be good enough. I need to have maybe 10. Ah, I see. Um, well, this, uh, there's a couple of questions that are tied together. Uh, I'll start with the, uh, with this one from uh, Juan Fernando. Uh, so what the sourdough library in Belgium is doing with the backslopping or refreshing schedule that they do is going to modify or modificate the original sourdough, right? I'm asking since they are the backup in case something happens with the original culture. So, so you're familiar with their work in, 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 at the library. They're trying to perpetuate sort of the, the original versions of these starters as, as the, almost like the, uh, you know, the, the archive if, if it ever needs to be brought back. So, the, the, so is the, clearly from what you're saying, the refreshment schedule that they're using is going to somehow make it different from and, the way it may be being yeah, used in yeah. its own base. Uh, I'm suspicious, uh, and I had this discussion with Stefan Capelle from Paratus. Uh, I'm suspicious that they actually preserve the initial combination of species. Uh, the reason for the suspicion is twofold. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the sourdough library maintains the sourdoughs at four degrees for a couple of months before they go back to the refreshment in my view, 
Some of these cancers never ever survives if you put it in a fridge for weeks. So you will kill it, no matter what you do. Uh, second, some lactobacilli grow just fine at four degrees centigrade, which means you have some which are important in sourdough and die, and you have others which you which are not very typical for sourdough, which start to grow. So I think the four degrees centigrade is not a storage which preserves anything, uh, but it, it, it will have a very substantial shift in the composition of organisms. Mm -hmm. The second reason, if you talk to a baker, of course they tell you uh, they do a 10% refreshment and they do 16 hours at 16 degree overnight, and then they do blah, blah, blah at 20 and, 20, uh, and 25 degrees centigrade. Uh, and you can try to replicate that. 16 hours, 16 degrees, 10% refreshment, 30% refreshment, 20 degrees for three hours. You can try to, ref uh, to, to replicate that. But in a bakery, the bakers don't do the same thing every day. The sourdough is a little bit different. Your production schedule is different. Your wheat flour is different. And now all of a sudden you start to improvise and to adjust because the sourdough doesn't smell right. And this is something that the baker does, but that the that the sour uh, that the, the sourdough library doesn't do, which means the baker controls the the baker controls the sourdough by maintaining the activity, and the sourdough library controls the fermentation by strictly adhering adhering to time, temperature, and other parameters. I, and I think if you do that for a couple of refreshments, it probably doesn't matter. If you do that over years, you get two completely different systems. So that's, and I'm skeptical. I can be convinced of the opposite. I always can be by good data, uh, but if there are data, it hasn't been published. Uh, and then, you know, even, even if your species composition is 99.9% is .9 off, if you send the sourdough back to the baker where you got it from, this 0.01% of the initial that is still there, they will take over quickly if they go back to the old feeding pit. Interesting, that's interesting. So um, you, you need you need ten cells, and the ten cells, if they're faster, they will take over the sourdough in as few as ten to twenty years. Well, well, that's kind of encouraging to know that you can sort of uh, you can bring it back in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris Stafferton in uh, in Tasmania is writing to us and asking uh, from your discussion of the beginning of a backslap starter when uh, Enterobacteria and Enterococcus, I'm, I'm saying it right, are present. Is there a food safety risk if the discard is used early in the development of the culture? No, no risk. No. And I have a high level. I have a high level of confidence, uh, and the high level of confidence is based on uh, on two uh, reasons. Uh, the first reason is enterococci and the enterobacteriaceae that you find in a early stages of a sourdough. They are unable to invade a healthy intestinal barrier, which means you could eat the sourdough without getting ill, because if you put enterococcus into an open wound, it uh -huh. will kill you. If you eat it, it will not kill you, and there is a sufficient number of fermented foods that contain enterococcus and never have made anyone ill. Uh, well, infections are wound infections. They are not from eating. Uh, the second reason, the one pullback of safety in baking is always the baking part. Uh, you put the bread into the oven and everything is dead and everything that includes enterococcus, enterobacteriaceae and all the lactobacilli that you have in your sourdough. Uh, so you kill everything before you eat it and afterwards you're safe. Well, I'm gonna end this portion. We've got many more questions and I'm hoping that those of you who have written these questions will come over to our after party, our next session. For those of you who are able to, uh, who have the VIP ticket, if you want to be a part of that and you don't have that ticket, immediately write to a question at uh, breadsymposium.com and ask them how you can upgrade to, to the, the after party, the VIP. But I'll, I'll ask one more of this because I think a lot of people are probably wondering this. Um, uh, there's a, and there's a couple here I'd love to ask before we run out of time, but we'll carry it over. Is there a method of keeping a reserve, a legacy sample of one starter via drying and storing is is drying and, and dehydrating the 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 starter uh, a valid method and and a, and, a, and a good method for keeping that I would almost want to call it the mother 
the mother essence alive? Uh, before I answer the question, uh, I, I will be happy to send you the PDF uh, of my presentation because I have provided all the links to the articles that I took the information from. Uh, I hope you have a means of disseminating that to the, to the participants. Uh, for the drying, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, some of this canvas doesn't dry well. Uh, it doesn't like anything other than growing fast in beef, sourdoughs, and one other place which we don't know. Uh, if you take a dough with Lacti planti bacillus pantarum and Lacti levi Lacti bacillus brevis, if you dry it in a serial matrix, the organisms will stay quite viable for some time. But dry storage will change the composition. If you want to preserve a legacy sourdough, in my view, you need to do two things. You need to isolate the strains and put the isolated strains in a minus 80 freezer where you can store them for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second thing that you need to do, the sourdough always links to the experience of the baker that maintains it. So somehow, if you want to get the same sourdough back, you need to get, you need to, you need to preserve that knowledge transfer it to another person before before that person dies, uh, because only if you have a baker that controls fermentation in a certain way, you can control the you can control the, the composition of organisms. Well, we, we again we have just uh, opened a can of worms for us, and uh, and we we'll hopefully can talk about this for another at least today another forty five minutes or so with you in the after party. Uh, we will. Uh, we'll take that uh, PDF that you have, and we'd love to post it. We'll make it available somehow, probably in the archive section of the symposium for those who are watching this on, on tape or want to go back and relook at those slides. We'll make that available. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I will, uh, I will, I will send it to you. And then uh, any man, anyone who remembers my last name, I'm easily Googled and usually happy to answer any, any inquiries by email. Good. Your, your uh, contact information should be in our again for for everyone who has a ticket you have access to the attendees uh you know mailing information so you can write yeah. directly to michael thank you for making that available as yeah. well uh so what we'll do is, is we'll say uh goodbye for this portion this is our webinar portion we're going to end this right now those of you who didn't get your questions asked please uh bring them back into the next round so that we can because there's a lot a lot of good ones that we didn't even get to touch that i'd love to dive into and we will see you in just a minute, for those of you who are, we have, we're going to take about a five minute break to give everyone a chance to, to uh, log back in to the, uh, to the VIP lounge. And we have to log out and log back in on a different link to come back to you. We'll take this little break. In the meantime, um, uh, we're going to have our little credit scroll here at the end. Feel free to watch that and then log back in and we'll see you in five minutes at the after party. Michael, again, many, many thanks for, being, for bringing all this knowledge to us. And thank all of you for being part of this. Join us in the after party, and we'll see you also on Wednesday uh, with Avery Rosica. Goodbye Good, for now. Thank you. See you in a few minutes on the other link. Yes, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our team behind the scenes. Our event technical and production partners, Ganoid Communications, including our producer, Gurmit Singh, and his team, Jida Gajaria, Gagandeep Singh, and Jaydev Kashari. Thanks also to Ted Nelson and Lael Fretzel of our creative and marketing team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University who supported me throughout this event. My executive assistant, Sarah Standifer, communications director, Melinda Law, Chancellor, Mim Rooney, Charlotte Campus President Cheryl Richards, and our executive team leaders, deans and faculty, Maureen Dumas, Michael Schrader, Michelle Nicholas, Mark Norman, Brent Steyerwalt, Laurie Heinbach, Jerry Lanuza, Amy Felder, Harry Paymiller, Richard Miskovich, and many, many others. Thank you all. <laughs>